Okay, so uh, we're changing gears from modeling and texturing, and we're going into animation, which means there's an entirely new set of tools uh, within Blender that we haven't even touched yet, and that we will now be turning our attention to. Um, animation in Blender, as with most every other form of animation, uh, revolves around keyframes. Now we've we've briefly done some keyframing before, uh, but let's take a little bit of time to kind of remind ourselves what that is and how that works in Blender. Uh, first, I'm going to disable my uh, manipulators because they get in my way. So if I go to front view and orthographic, and I start with this default cube, uh, if I want to add a keyframe. There's a few different ways that I can do it. Uh, the first and the easiest way is just to hit I on the keyboard, and then I can choose what type of keyframe that I want to insert. Uh, I can insert a keyframe that is just keeping track of the location, or just the rotation, or just the scale. I could do location and rotation, but not scale, and um, varying combinations thereof. Uh, another way that I can do it is I can go to whatever value that I want to keyframe, hover over it, and hit I, uh, that value will turn yellow. The frame number will turn orange, telling me that I have a keyframe uh, on that frame. If I go to the next frame, it'll turn green, which means that this value has a keyframe, but it is not on that current frame. And if I go back to frame one, it turns yellow again, telling me that there is a keyframe for that value on that frame. Okay. Uh, I can also insert a keyframe. Uh, down here, I've got this record button in my timeline. If I hit that, and I start rotating my cube, you can see that these turn gold, which means a keyframe has been inserted. So this record button is automatically uh, recording my manipulations as keyframes. So I can go a few frames down the line, move it over here, keyframe is automatically added. Uh, go a few more frames down the line. If I hit shift and up arrow, I can jump 10 frames at a time to frame 51. Maybe I'll go over here and I'll scale it up and I'll rotate it like that. Okay, so I've got these three keyframes and uh, now I can play back my animation. How do you play back an animation? Well, let me tell you. Yes. Option A or Alt A if you prefer will play back the animation. Uh, now if you look at the timeline, I have a start frame of 1, I have an end frame of 250. The number next to that is my current frame, so I can type in, if I want to go to frame 30, I can just type in frame 30. Uh, I can click and drag uh, on that number or just in the timeline itself. Um, I can play forward pause, I can play backward if I want to. Um, so if you want to test how something looks like in reverse, that's how you do it. I can uh, jump between keyframes, and if I click the outermost buttons, I can jump to the beginning and the end of my animation. Uh, I've got some menus here that are fairly, well the view menu is, is fairly standard. Um, you can insert markers onto the timeline like you can in uh, Premiere. Uh, I've got a frame menu, which uh, currently my auto keyframing mode is set to add and replace. I could also have it just set to replace. If I turn off frame record, um, then I can, uh, actually can I set those with that on? I can. There's no difference if I turn record on or off, but uh, I can also set my start and end frame. Um, this way, and if you see, I've got an S and an E for key commands for setting my start and end frame. Uh, and you can think of those like in and out points. But in Blender, it's start and end. Uh, and then I've got playback. Uh, there are times when you'll have audio synced up to your animation, and when you start scrubbing through and worrying about animation, the audio gets really annoying. So in your playback menu, you can tell it to mute the audio um, and a variety of other options. So that is the timeline. Uh, one other thing to note about the timeline, if I change my end frame to, let's say, 100, 
Uh, you can see the part that is visible, or, or the, the, the part that is the active timeline, or the, you know, the current whole range is in lighter gray, and everything else is in darker gray. Uh, I can still add keyframes in the darker gray, but when I render out my animation, uh, those frames won't be rendered. You can adjust your animation render settings in the render properties here on the side. Uh, you've got your render presets, which we have briefly gone over before, your resolution. Uh, but you also have your start frame and your end frame. You also have an option called frame step. So if you want to skip every other frame, set the frame step to 2. I don't know if it plays back that way. No, it doesn't play back that way, but it'll render out every other frame. You can also choose your frame rate. Um, I recommend setting your frame rate before you start animating, uh, because otherwise things will feel a little bit slower, a little bit fast if you change it after the fact. Um, you can also play around with frame frame rate uh, later on if you want to start dealing with slow motion and fast motion. Uh, we also have time remapping. Um, I don't know exactly how to use time remapping, but I bet it's pretty cool once you figure it out. So I will do some research on that myself uh, and figure out exactly how that works. Oh. Okay, so I can, I've got my render animation settings here. Uh, a thing to note, and I know I've discussed this before, if I go to, let's see, it's not performance, it's output right here. I can choose image formats or movie formats. When we render animations, uh, we're going to do it as an image, as still frames. That'll, that'll export each individual frame into a folder of your specification uh, as defined here. And the reason that we do that is uh, twofold. First, if you render out as a movie and Blender crashes while you're rendering, you lose everything. You have to start the render from zero. If you render out as images, once each frame is done, that image is saved. And then if it crashes, you can pick up where you left off. It also means that if you're doing this at home on your computer and you actually want to use your computer um, while you're rendering, you can pause the render, stop the render, play your games, or do whatever you're doing on your computer, and then before you go to bed, set up the render and render up the next batch of frames. Because I'm sure you've started to realize rendering one frame can take a while. So if you're rendering 24 frames a second over 15 seconds, that's going to take uh, considerably longer. Um, another th advantage of this is that you can fairly easily um, loop animations. So if you're just rendering out a walk cycle, uh, you only have to render out one of those cycles, and then you just duplicate the image sequence on the timeline, and you've got multiple cycles of that walk cycle without having to render out each frame in a you know, 30 cycle uh, animation. Uh, it also makes replacing just certain parts of an animation easier. So if your camera pans across a scene and right in the middle of the scene is, there, is a red box and you want that box to be blue, if you're rendering out uh, individual images, you only have to re-render the, the particular frames that have that box in the shot. The beginning and the end where the box isn't in there, you don't have to re-render. So it's just time saving overall and uh, a bit safer as well. Um, going back to the timeline here real quick, there's a couple more controls that I want to mention. Uh, the first is we've got on the timeline the, the frame numbers. We've got two dots on either end. If you click and drag those, you can adjust the scale and kind of zoom in on your timeline. If you want to see your timeline just the active area, if you hit the home key on your keyboard, it will zoom in so that fills the timeline. Uh, pretty handy uh, stuff right there. OK, so that is kind of how to, how to quickly and simply get keyframes made and get a simple animation. But now we need to figure out how to manipulate those keyframes once we've made them. Because most of the time when you make a keyframe, you're going to want to make an adjustment of some sort. Uh, so for that, I'm going to split my viewport. And I'm going to change the lower one to the dope sheet. Now the dope sheet, 
if I hit home in the dope sheet, I can also zoom in uh, so it fills up my timeline. Uh, the dope sheet is how you can adjust your timing. So I've got keyframes in the dope sheet just like I have on my timeline. Um, if I look here on the left, I have a hierarchy. So I've got my cube object. I have a cube action. Uh, objects can have different actions. Think of it like if you have a character, you can have one action that is a walk cycle, another action that is a run cycle, uh, another action that is maybe an idle cycle if you're doing a game, something like that. Um, but within this action, I've got my keyframes for my location, rotation, and scale. Uh, and then I also have just X, Y, and Z location uh, keyframes. Now I can right click to select a keyframe. Uh, if you notice, if I right click on this X location keyframe, uh, I have these three keyframes up here selected, and that's telling me that I'm selecting an attribute of the dope sheet summary, an attribute of the cube, and specifically the cube action. So that's why those are highlighted as well. So I have these keyframes. Uh, I can box select to select multiple keyframes. I can double. I can hit A to select everything or nothing. Uh, I can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Uh, I can also select a keyframe and I can hit G to move it. So if I want the keyframe to actually be over here, I can do that and it'll adjust that keyframe. I can select a keyframe and hit Shift D to duplicate it. Now if I duplicate it, I've got this line connecting the two uh, keyframes. And what that means is that the value between these two hasn't changed. Okay. Now the cube is still moving because it's got attributes that are changing along the uh, z-axis and along the y-axis, uh, and it's also scaling up. But the x location is unchanged. Okay, it's not moving left or right in these uh, between frame 26 and 39. Okay, so that's what that means. Uh, I can move it all the way over here on the other side of these keyframes and now it's going to be kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, so in this way if I first kind of block out my animation in the 3D view and I realize that you know if it's a bouncing ball, if the ball bounces too fast for the first couple bounces I can jump into the dope sheet, grab those keyframes and just slide them out. Another cool thing that you can do is you can scale in the dope sheet. You can scale your keyframes. So if, if I play this back right now uh, with uh, Alt A or Option A. If I think that happens a little bit too slow, I can select everything and scale it down. And it scales to the uh, playhead, this vertical green line. Um, so if I move it back to zero and hit S, if I want it to, to play at twice the speed, I want to scale it to 0.5. Okay? And now I play it back and it goes faster. I can, if I want to double the speed, I can hit S and 2. It'll double the speed, Alt A, and it will play back slower. Okay. Now if you notice, also automatically, um, the playback will loop based on what is your start and end frame. So once it gets to frame 100, it'll automatically go back to zero. Uh, regardless of whether or not you have keyframes outside of that range. So that's the dope sheet and that's how you can adjust uh, timings. And you can also, I should mention this, is you can also copy these keyframes to different objects. So if I add in a, a UV sphere and I'm just going to scale it up a little bit so you can see it and I'm going to um, Actually, that'll be good. What I can do is with this first thing with the with the sphere is I have to give it a group of keyframes so that I have something to copy it to. But then I can take my cube and if I just box select everything on the cube, hit Command C, select my sphere, and 
uh, I have to do location rotation scale. So copy that and paste. I swear you can do it. And expand that out. Make it a little easier. Box select the values that I want to copy. Command C. And then go up to here. And Command V. There we go. So now the keyframes are copied. Now it's not moving because those are these keyframes down here which are covering uh, which are controlling its motion but it is following the rotation and the scale so that is possible as well I'll undo all of that though and just delete the sphere okay so that's how we control timing um, but now let's think about spacing and to that, I'm going to change my dope sheet to the graph editor. Those of you who have worked in uh, After Effects with that graph editor, this is very similar to that. This is where you can get the most in-depth and fine tune control over your animations. Um, not only can you adjust the timing here, you can also adjust the value. So. I'm going to actually delete this cube for a second. And, well, not for a second. I'm just going to delete it. And I'm going to add in a UV sphere. I'm going to tab to go into edit mode and just move it up one unit so that the origin is at the ground. Um, just because I like to work that way. Okay. So I've got um, I've got this ball, and I'm going to move it up. Set a keyframe for my lo location. And then I'm going to jump ahead 20 frames, and I'm going to clear out the Z location so it's back on the ground, and then I'm going to hit I and location. And now, in the graph editor, I can see there's a line and a value that changes. Uh, if I go to zero and hit Alt-A, you can see it move. And what it's doing is it's kind of easing out of its starting point, speeding up, and then slowing down to its end point. And that is represented by this graph. Uh, a note about moving around in the graph editor. I can zoom in and out with the scroll wheel. Uh, if I hold down uh, control and option, I can zoom both vertically and horizontally. I can also just hit the home key to frame everything up that is selected. Um, the way the graph editor works, uh, we've got a hierarchy here on the side just like we do in the dope sheet. And we've got X values, which are our keyframes, or not our keyframes, our frames. And then we have Y values, which are uh, representative of the value that is, is being animated. So we've got um, right down here is our zero line. And then I've got plus 2, plus 4, plus 6, and then below it I have minus 2 and minus 4, and it goes all the way down. Uh, and then we have our keyframes here. I've got my X channel, my Y channel, and my Z channel. I'm going to, I can hide different channels by clicking the eyeball. I can also mute different channels. And so the way that the mute works is let's say that on top of just moving up and down, or moving straight down, uh, let's say that at the end the sphere also ends up over here. Okay. So now it's moving diagonally. If I only want to concern myself with the vertical motion, I can mute the x-axis, and now it's moving straight up and down. That keyframe key and that transformation is still there, but I'm not seeing it when I play back so that I can focus just on the vertical movement. Uh, and then I also have a lock to lock the, uh, the graph so I don't accidentally edit it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to undo my X transformation. I don't want to worry about that right now. Okay. 
Um, so I've got, in, in the graph editor, I can adjust the timing and I can also adjust the values. So I've got my keyframe here. I right click to select it. Uh, first, I'm going to hide the X and the Y, just to make it simpler. I've got my keyframe here. Now, if I hit G, I can move this wherever. And if I move it up, the value actually goes up. And you'll, you'll see that directly reflected here in my transform uh, location values in the 3D viewport. And those will directly correspond to this scale on the left side of my graph editor. So G, and if I hit Y, it'll lock it to the up and down. And again, I, I can adjust the values that way. I can make it go below zero or above zero. And I can do this with any value that I can keyframe. They will all show up in the graph editor. Um, and then I can also, you know, adjust the timing left and right, however I want. I can also adjust uh, a couple more things that that really start giving you some fine levels of control. And the first is the interpolation type. So if I hit T, it brings up my keyframe interpolation. You can also access that in the key menu and uh, interpolation mode right here. I have constant, linear, and Bezier. So if I choose constant, this is what it does. The value will stay the same until the moment that there's another keyframe that tells it otherwise. And if I play this back, that's what it looks like. It just jumps. It's one place and then immediately it's another place. If I hit T again and change it to linear, this is what linear looks like. It is a constant speed. It's a constant slope uh, for those of you who remember math. Uh, and if I do that, it just moves at a constant speed. I'm going to set my end frame something more like 50. Uh, it just moves at a constant speed until it's done. And then if I hit T one more time and go to Bezier, you can see that the curve is now, uh, well, curvy. And hit Alt A and it will speed up and then it'll slow down before the end. So it's easing in and easing out. Um, any, of you, any of you who have animated before will be very familiar with this principle. Uh, this is how it works in Blender. So that's one of the, I gotta remember where I can actually see this uh, spelled out. Huh? V. Questions about that? No? Okay, questions on that? Okay. It looks like we've got a little over an hour left. So let's get animating, shall we? Quick show of hands, how many of you have animated a bouncing ball before? Yeah. Um, I realize that this is a common thing to do. But it's a good exercise because it's, it's a familiar way to get comfortable with these specific tools and how they are different than any other animation system that you're used to. Okay. All right, is your mouse in the 3D viewport? Yes. You hit I? And it didn't set a keyframe? Do you have the ball selected? Questions? All the way at the top. Yep. Yeah, I'm starting. I'm starting with the ball in here. Okay. okay. Oh, hey, I'm still recording. So, whoever's watching this that isn't part of this class, you just got a little behind-the-scenes peek. That'll be fun. Uh, so where was I? That's the top. And then that one, and then 
that one, and then another 30 f or 20 frames, and we'll say maybe there, I location, another 20 frames, and there, I location, another 20 frames. This one needs to be up a touch. I uh, location. Another 20 frames. And let's see. I location. And another 20 frames. Move it up just a touch. I and location. Okay. So now I have a less natural descent. And the reason why is because I don't have any keyframes for it hitting the ground in between. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to split my 3D view from the bottom up and change the bottom section to my dope sheet. And then I'm going to hit home to expand that out so I can see things a little bit clearer. Uh, also while I think of it, I'm going to set my end frame to I think 180 should be good okay now if I look at my keyframes here let me zoom out on my 3d view so I can see everything that's happening if I look at my keyframes here my last frame the balls on the ground which is where it's going to be every time it hits the ground so I can select that keyframe and uh, hit command C and then I'm gonna go to frame 10 and hit Command V and frame 30, Command V, and right on down the line. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, if I play back my animation. It feels like it's on an elastic band. Okay, uh, and that's because the uh, spacing is off. So now what I want to do is go into my graph editor. And one of the cool things about animating a bouncing ball with a graph editor is the graphical representation of its motion is very accurate to its actual path. It's, it's very directly translatable um, and, and pretty easy to make sense of. Uh, but I'm going to hold down Control and Option and left click and uh, just get everything kind of filled out the way that I want to so I can see everything well. Um, and then I'm going to expand out my location and I'm just going to hide my X and my Y because I'm only concerned about my Z location. Okay. So let's first just focus on the first 10 frames here. And what do we notice about the start here? Um, the beginning, yeah, I think the beginning will be all right. But the second keyframe here, it's, it's slowing down as it approaches the ground. Um, balls don't really do that. They just are acted upon by gravity. And according to Isaac Newton, they stay acted upon, um, and they stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So it's going to continue accelerating due to gravity until an outside force acts on it, which in this case is the ground. So we need to represent that. And the way to do that is select this ground keyframe, uh, hit V, and change the handle type to vector. And first before we do anything else let's look see how that looks it's better and as a matter of fact if I zoom out of my graph editor and let's see let's, uh, let's do that and just box select all of these ground keyframes so I select every ground keyframe and hit it oh, sorry not I V and set those all to vector. Okay, now let's see how that looks. Alt A. 
getting there, but it still feels like it's floating just a touch. So now what we can do is we can go to each of these uh, keyframes and adjust the handles just a little bit more. Okay. So I'm going to select this first, this first handle and G and I'll bring it up to, I don't know, maybe there. I'll select the other handle and bring it up to there. So it's going to look a lot more parabolic. Um, I think that's the right word. It's been a while since my math class, um, but we'll we'll pretend that that's the right word. And if not, I apologize. Um, so now, if I hit all day, there, that feels better. And there's actually a way that we could, well, never mind. I'll get I'll get to that later. Um, but now, if I go and I do the same thing for the rest of the handles. Now, I'm not moving them completely vertically, but just a little off and just a little under. So I got these smooth curves here. And as I go, I, I adjust my uh, graph editor view so I can more easily uh, ensure that I have the smooth arcs that I want. And okay. So now, maximize this view. Go back to the beginning, Alt A. That feels a bit better. Um, my timing might still be a little bit off. Um, let me look at that one more time. It feels like it hangs in the air a little bit too long. Or that or bounces too high. Yeah, kind of hangs in the air a bit long there. And I think part of that is at the end. I currently have it set so that each bounce takes the same amount of time, which actually isn't right at all. So um, what I might do is go to my dope sheet, because that's I want to adjust the timing. And then I'm going to select. Uh, Let's see if we want that's the first bounce. So we'll select all of these and maybe move them in uh, one frame and then we'll go to the second bounce. Actually we'll go to the third bounce and maybe move those in a little bit. The next bounce. Maybe move this, those in a little bit, and then just kind of con continue. Whoops. To play a little bit until we get the timing where we want it. Uh, and I realize I don't think I did that right, but. I mean, that, that already feels much better. At the end, it probably still needs to be even shorter. Um, but you can kind of get the idea. And then you just continue to uh, tweak all of these uh, keyframes and handles and keep going until you get the feel you're going for. I might even bring these ones at the end in even more. Okay. Now let's see how that feels. That's better.
Okay. So the next step then would be if I get rid of my grease pencil there, um, and go to just another layer. For the homework then, your bouncing path will be, oops, not GD, something like that. And I can't draw with a mouse. I can barely draw with a pen, um, but something like that. God, that is awful. I Wow, that was bad. Um, but something like this. So it'll bounce. These bounce will be smaller until it eventually just rolls away and maybe even stops uh, due to friction. So three different balls, or kind of a regular bouncy ball, basketball, tennis ball, something like that. Um, a really bouncy ball like a super ball, and then a uh, not so very bouncy ball like a bowling ball or medicine ball. Uh, something like that. But the process uh, will be the same. It's just instead of only worrying about the z-axis, you'll also be worrying about the x-axis uh, and making sure that it is smooth the whole way um, and, and feels like a bouncing ball.